And we are live with day two of World Building Con. Guys, welcome, welcome one and all. G goodness, there's almost a thousand of you already this morning. <sighs> As you know, Virtual World Building Con, this is the very, very first one. We are honored to be here bringing you from the comfort of your own screen, some of the leaders of the world building world. And today is no exception. Now, it may be strange to think that we are talking about when to stop world building at World Building Con, but of course, all things in moderation, and we must know how and when to deliver our world building in the best way. And uh, when to when to stop getting obsessed with our worlds as well. And that's what we're talking about today with some of the most fabulous guests in the space. I would like to welcome to the Virtual World Building Con stage, Chris Fox, John Joseph Adams, Jason Sizemore and C.L. Clark. Guys, welcome, welcome. <laughs> it is such an honor to have you here. I won't make you all speak at once, don't worry. <laughs> um, Chris Fox, how are you doing? I am doing quite well, thank you for asking. Fantastic. It's wonderful to have you here. Chris Fox is the Amazon best-selling author of the Magitech Chronicles, Shattered Worlds, and the Dark Lord Burt. He loves RPGs and is very proud to have one of his own imprint, all to impress a girl, now his wife and the <laughs> mother of his son. Chris, we are so honored to have you here. And of course, C.L. Clark, welcome. How are you doing today? Good, really good. It's nice Fantastic. and kind of sunny. Yeah, amazing. Mm -hmm. Uh, can I ask where you are in the world, roughly? I'm in London right now. Ooh, very mm -hmm. nice. In which case, I know that Sonny is a, is a red <laughs> for London. <laughs> C.L. Clark is the author of The Unbroken, the first book of the Magic of the Lost trilogy. She graduated from Indiana University's Creative Writing, MFA, and was a 2012 Lambda Literary Fellow. She's been a personal trainer, an English teacher, and an editor, and is some combination thereof as she travels the world, currently London, as we know. When she's not writing or working, she's learning languages, doing P90 something, or reading about the war and post-colonial history. She's a former co-editor of the Hugo-nominated and British Fantasy Award-winning Podcastle, and her work has appeared in Uncanny, Beyond, uh, Beneath Ceaseless Skies, Fantasy Magazine, and more. She's represented by Mary C. Moore of Kimberly Cameron and Associates, and she's here today to talk about when to stop world building. C.L. So, Clark, do you have a personal investment in this? Is this something that you personally <laughs> identify with, or are you here to teach us, um, not from experience, but from a place of zen and wisdom? <laughs> Um, I would say from a place of trial and error, actually, <laughs> but yeah, yeah, I have a personal stake in this for sure as an editor and as a, as a writer. So I really see, excited. I see so many nods. I am here for it. <laughs> and of course, Jason Sizemore. Um, how are you doing, Jason? Where are you coming in from today? Oh, I'm doing great. Thank you for having me. Uh, I'm in from Lexington, Kentucky. Lexington, Kentucky. Amazing. How's the weather there? Pretty miserable. <laughs> Pretty miserable, oh, but we're yeah. going to brighten your day by talking about world building. Yeah. Jason Sizemore is the owner and editor-in-chief of Apex Magazine and Apex Books. He's been nominated for multiple Hugo Awards for his editing work. His most recent anthologies include Do Not Go Quietly, Stories of Resistance, and Apex Magazine 2021. Jason, we are honored to have you. And finally, John Joseph Adams, not a stranger to the world building, <laughs> uh, world anvil twitch. We've had you here before. How are you doing mm -hmm. today? Oh, doing very well. Fantastic. Well, John Joseph Adams is not just uh, 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 coming here from an editing and a, and a writing perspective, also for an RPG perspective like Chris. So we've got a little bit of representation from everywhere, from all, all the media types, which is fantastic. Uh, John Joseph Adams is a series editor of Best American Science Fiction Fantasy and is the editor of more than 30, yes, 30, anthologies such as Wasteland, Lost Worlds and Magical Kingdoms and Epic uh, Legends of Fantasy. He's also an editor and publisher of the Hugo award-winning magazine Lightspeed and its publisher of sister magazines Nightmare and Fantasy. So what I love here is we have writers, we have editors who are the first to tell the writers when they need to stop mm -hmm. world building and write the damn book and get it on the page and stop putting in extra fluff. We have RPG writers as well, which is world building delivered in a in a sort of collaborative space. So I think I think we've won. I think mm -hmm. we are the fellowship. We have to start talking <laughs> about when to stop world building. So let's kick off with um, with a really important question. Why do we need to stop world building? Mm -hmm. What happens when we don't? Uh, John, do you want to kick this one off? 
Uh, sure. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think the danger in not stopping world building is that you can just keep world building and then never get to either your story or to um, to you know get your campaign going if it's for an RPG. Um, but I think it's also equally important to remember that if you uh, don't stop world building, you might not leave enough space in the world for either your players to discover and and uh, discover things. And then like for and then, well, I mean, if they do that and then like you're like, oh, now I have to redo everything that I already made because this other thing seems like it would be more interesting based on the choices my players made. So that's the danger in RPGs. Um, in a book, uh, you might sort of write out all this stuff and then you put yourself into a corner because, you know, you're like, oh, well, I've already I've already established all of this uh, world building in my head and I don't want to contradict it. I mean, you could just go change it to match what you did, but it's it just sometimes you got to stop yourself from doing that. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, CL Clark, what are your thoughts on this? Again, coming from a from a, <laughs> a slightly different space. I mean, I definitely agree with John on the um, like leaving yourself a little bit of room to retcon some information as necessary. Um, because especially with a novel, like an epic series or something, there's going to be something that you didn't predict that you just have to do for either plot reasons or character reasons. And yes, having the walls of world building, um, it helps with your creativity, but sometimes you just need to be able to erase something and then put what you need in its place. Um, but from a, a more specifically writer's point of view, if you keep world building, you just don't write the story. Um, and like no, no amount of um, wiki or or brainstorming document, or like, I don't even know how many Scrivener files I have with just <laughs> what if this happens or this happens, and then this this is the setting, this is the magic system. Like, I, I like if I, I could do that for forever, and as cool as it would be, the story itself wouldn't exist if I didn't actually write it. Um, so I think that's probably my biggest thing is eventually you have to get the work done. And so I, I kind of, I'm a little bit weird maybe for most fantasy and sci-fi writers is I actually do just the bare minimum amount of world building beyond what is neat, like whatever sparks the idea. And then I write the story and I just mm. kind of build out the world as needed to continue, like kind of like putting the road out in front of my feet. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Now I've seen Chris nodding along. <laughs> I know Chris has developed an entire novel, which is also, sorry, an entire novel series, not, not the one, the many, um, and also an RPG campaign setting. So how has that, um, how has that been between the two different media for you with regard to holding yourself back from doing too much world building? Well, I mean, first understand that your fans can see behind the curtain if you release an RPG. So they can see the rule set and they know how all your, your scenes are going to be written, which is fine. But it means you have to follow your rules mm -hmm. and you have to know them intrinsically. So I, I think you you know that you need to stop or slow down on world building when the story is starting to suffer as a direct result, which you're hearing over and over from a lot of us, regardless of what our background is. And as an example that we can all commonly relate to, remember Game of Thrones season eight? <laughs> do you remember how much time we spent in our head wondering about the wall and the white walkers and why do they exist and what are they doing and what do they want and what is their whole goal why did the wall exist and then look how that played out now the world building there is fantastic it, it, it captured the imagination of the globe but the execution of the story was awful and you know look what happened as a direct result of that so if we spend all of our time world building, we can make something fantastic, but you also need to put the time in building stories. And if you build them concurrently, I find that's what works best. So I have, gosh, 35 or 40 novels out. I should know the answer to that, but I hmm. don't. Um, and they're all in the same series effectively. So I have a post-apocalyptic series. I have an epic space fantasy series. Um, I have a military science fiction series. And what I've done is cleverly woven these all into be one series. So they all have Easter eggs to each other. They're all in the same universe. Uh, but what that means is I have to be really careful on how much time I spend doing the world building because the story has to be paramount. So I do need my world building to line up, but I, I basically I have to do the, the story first and foremost, make sure it works. And then if I have extra time, which, you know, how, how often do we have extra time, uh, then it goes into the world building. <laughs> Absolutely. I'm grinning away because I know that Chris, uh, Chris is a World Anvil user, so I know that, that all of that <laughs> extra time he's talking about, that, that's going on World Anvil. 
-hmm. And Jason, I'm really curious to hear, you know, we've heard a lot about procrastination. We've heard a lot about, you know, the danger of painting yourself into a corner or being prescriptive for your RPG players. Um, how about in short fiction? What are the dangers of too much world building when we're getting to such a, a sort of restricted, restricted in terms of length medium? Yeah, one of the uh, more popular criticisms that you'll see of certain works is uh, this feels like it should be a novel mm -hmm. or um, there's too many plot threads left unresolved. And, you know, I, I think that comes from an, an author just being too enthusiastic with the world building. And as an editor, you know, it's our job to be to be able to gauge you know, what is the right amount and um, when to uh, apply the break or when to tell the writer to throw the whole paint bucket all over the work. Uh, <laughs> uh, since the world building, in my experience with writers and as, as a very rare writer on occasion myself, uh, the world building is often one of the most fun parts. So it uh it's very easy to get mired in the fun aspect of it and and, and like CEO was saying and John you you have to just get down to put words on paper and um be judicious in what world details you let come out yeah absolutely um i'd love to hear a little bit more about process on this so I'd love to welcome CL to talk about this. CL, what are your thoughts about, you know, process with regards to choosing which details go on the page of these worlds we've built, essentially? Oh, you unmuted, CL. Just uh, unmute yourself. There we go. Kind of um, the, it's a little bit, I, I think um, a lot about what um, Jason was saying, actually, because I, also have written short fiction and but I went I went into short fiction with kind of a novelist's heart <laughs> so a lot of my first rea reactions to some of my first stories was um this is really really cool but definitely should be a novel and I was like no I can't I don't want to write a novel so one of the biggest things I had to learn in the earlier stage of my short fiction career was how to pick what information stays and what um, goes and I think I still think that I'm probably in the minority as of being a, a a short fiction writer who really just has a really robust world like an epic fantasy world and a tiny tiny package just because it's what I like I still I still have the epic um, fantasist in my heart and it doesn't really go away when I go to short fiction and so for me that one of the main techniques I use in short fiction is just um, figuring out what is plot necessary. And usually I will overwrite and then cut based on readers reactions like like um, beta readers um, or even sometimes editor rejections. <laughs> uh, um, I, and by that, I will learn what information they found was most useful, what information they still thought was lacking. And even if I don't agree that the information that they said is lacking needs to go on the page, it does usually mean that something isn't quite working as far as the information the reader needs. And so I find ways that I can slip that in either like in very subtle dialogue or very subtle character reactions, talking like sentences, like a sentence max, um, but definitely not paragraphs or anything like that. With the novel though, I was having a field day because I was like, oh, there's so much space. This is great. Um, but I actually had the exact opposite problem. I was running into plot issues and character issues. I didn't know how to write the story. For example, The Unbroken, which was my first novel, I couldn't figure out how the, how the story would go until I realized that I didn't know enough about the the way the world, the countries in this world interacted, which means I had to go back and figure out economy, which means then I had to, I realized that so much of the economy was magic, which then I realized meant that the magic system and the religion had to have different repercussions in each country. And so I had to go back and backfill the world building before I could actually continue forward with the story again. Um, so two very different 
types of process for the different medium media, which is kind of interesting now that I think about it explicitly. <laughs> Yeah, it's very interesting that you say that because um, one of the things that we talk about so often is that, you know, a lot of people think you do the world building and then you create the thing. And and that that's not something that can happen necessarily unless you have thought of every single detail in advance, which which most people don't. Um, you know, you, you have to do some world building as you're going through because the creative process continues, which means the world keeps growing and, and you need to show things. Uh, Jason, I'm really curious to hear from you. What are, um, yeah, my door was oh, shut, but that didn't last question. long. <laughs> <laughs> this is the first cat appearance in world building con. You're welcome, guys. Yeah. Uh, um, so Jason, I'm really curious to hear from you because as an editor, this must be something you have to help people with a lot. Uh, what are the details that people tend to leave in or the information that people tend to leave in that you you find yourself again and again suggesting this this needs to be cut or this needs to be rephrased or this needs to be sort of reapproached? Uh, most commonly in short fiction, it's too many characters. Um, People love to, you know, they come, you know, in their world building, they, they come up with these interesting characters. And sometimes uh, I'll agree they're interesting, but then I'll have to, you know, do the main editor thing and recommend that, you know, you cut this out, uh, that, you know, we're playing with the limited number of words. So, uh, and the other is certainly there are, are often allusions to plot outside of the primary plot that's never really uh, picked up or there's no payoff on. Um, I think sometimes writers get so close to the world that they're building that um, they see everything as being interrelated Thus, everything is important, and certainly it is. Um, but to the reader, uh, their primary concern, you know, is in a short story that one thread. Yeah, absolutely. How do you feel that this uh, differs in a novel compared to a short story, Chris? What are your thoughts? A novel gives you more room to play, but it really doesn't change anything. You still have the reader going into the first paragraph and, and reading the first sentence, and whether or not they're interested is going to depend on whether or not you have strong characters in a good story, not immediately on your world building. They want to know about that stuff, but they probably read something about your story to give them a hook, and then you can roll it out slowly. So you, even in a novel, no matter how long it is, have to start with the characters first, and then you can kind of fold in the world building. So one of my nonfiction books is called Plot Gardening, and the basic idea is you need to set up a, a kind of a framework of world building where you're doing your genre cues. So what is travel and communication? That's the sort of basic world building you should do right out of the box. What can magic achieve? Just some basic understanding. You don't have to define the whole thing. And then you think about how does that shape my character's immediate world? What is their life like? You know, um, the Dark Lord Bert, he follows around adventurers and adventurers take all the gold and sometimes they take the silver, but they leave the copper behind. And so the Dark Lord Bert rakes up the copper into his backpack and that's how he makes a living um, <laughs> you think about the, <laughs> you think about the world that, that your characters occupy and then you can tell an interesting story so um you're always kind of playing this this game of tennis where you're doing your story but then you run into a point where you need more world building but then you want to you know run into a point where you got to get back to the story and it's back and forth and back and forth so i do them in tandem as, as a process from beginning to end uh even in a long series of novels Really interesting, really interesting. I mean, what I'm hearing from everyone is, you know, it's a it's a reiterative process. I love the term gardening. I think <laughs> that really is editing really is gardening in so many ways. You know, it's like just a little bit of pruning here and a little bit of tidying up there. And then we put some flowers in and maybe we change the pot that this is sitting in and everything flows together better. I think that's that's beautiful. Uh, John, I'm really curious to hear your thoughts on this specifically with regard to RPGs, because again, I know you're an avid RPG mm -hmm. player as well as an RPG writer. And this is something where, you know, if we try not to show too much world building and, and overwhelm people, um, and in this case, of course, the people are our players, mm -hmm. um, how, how can we manage to do this when we're dealing not with main characters where we can steer the camera, but with living, breathing, and often mm -hmm. very rowdy RPG players? 
Uh, well, it's certainly very challenging to know how much you need to have ready because you don't, you, you know, uh, no plan ever su survives contact with the players. So like, you never know where they're going to go. You never know what questions they're going to ask. You you don't know which thread they're going to tug on. You some some throwaway thing. You think you're it's you think it's a throwaway thing, and then they latch onto it, and you're like, oh well, I suddenly have to come up with all this stuff. But um, it's uh, it's all really a juggling act, and and um, it, you just have to have a good understanding of what you want the world to be so that you mm -hmm. can maybe improvise some stuff on the fly. And then when the players show interest in something, you can, you know, sort of, um, uh, you know, delve into that in between sessions or something. Now, that's all fine and good if you're just talking to a DM of a home game or something. But if you're talking as like an RPG writer, um, you know, that obviously that's more challenging. But um, but then you're you're trying to provide all of the information that the GM is going to need so that they're not going to be ambushed by their players like this. And, you know, the answers will be in there somewhere. Um, you know, that's, that's just sort of the thing that I think, um, you know, you have to, you have to figure out what the, what the main story is that you're telling in the adventure and then just include the stuff that's essential to that. Because, well, like with a short story, like any adventure, like if it's a one shot or something that's being published in an anthology of one shots or, or the like, it's like, there's very limited amount of space that you're going to have to, to put any world building in something at all. And it's even more challenging when you have a, a, a one shot that's supposed to be setting agnostic. Uh, so it's like, you have to put in some flavor to give the GM something to work with, but then it has to be sort of uh, generic in a way that uh, can just drop into whatever campaign you have with minimal, um, you know, with minimal tweaking if the GM wants it to be very specifically fitting into their world. Um, so it's uh, it's definitely a huge challenge on the RPG side, um, uh, whereas on the fiction side, it's much more something that you can control because it's like there's the same there's all kinds of work that you have to do to in order to make it logically consistent and and to to do all the other things that everybody else was saying but then um at least you have the control of the final product and um you know you don't have somebody throwing your curveballs every time when 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 they're reading the story it's like well if they do that then that's on them you know like they their yeah. imagination can run wild yeah absolutely there's no accounting for you see a statue i lick <laughs> the statue <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> players, players, man, just players. So we've talked a lot about, um, beg your pardon. We've talked a lot about, um, you know, creating, creating worlds, but where we're not expo dumping, we're not delivering too many details. What tricks then can we use to give the illusion of a really deep and immersive world without just being like, and here is my world anvil disguised mm -hmm. as a novel. Mm -hmm. Like here is my entire <laughs> world building my book mm -hmm. <laughs> disguised as a novel. Does anyone want to jump up on this? Pick I do. You. All right, Chris, <laughs> take it, take it. All right, so what you want to do is give them any pattern, any pattern at all. It doesn't matter what the pattern is. If you give them a pattern, their brain's going to take it and run with it. Mm -hmm. So all you have to do is present certain patterns in your world, the way money is spent, the way people talk, speech patterns. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe everybody ends with, uh, you know, and the blessing of the light at the end of a mm -hmm. sentence, you know, little things like that. And they're going to start inferring and it's going to start world building. And you'll mm -hmm. see it influence the way they speak as players. And it looks like somebody else wants to talk. <laughs> go, go. <laughs> Who was it? Was uh, it I thought it was you. Oh, yeah. well, I was just nodding along because I was agreeing with what you were saying. Um, but um, but yeah, you know, I mean, this this brings to mind, I may have actually mentioned this when Janet interviewed me, but um, there's a story I published in Lightspeed called uh, Biographical Fragments of the Life of Julian Prince uh, by Jake Kerr. And it's a post-apocalyptic story, but it's told in this series of excerpts. Like it's got like an excerpt of a Wikipedia entry for this one writer named Julian Prince, who was basically the chronicler of the apocalypse, uh, that happened in like, you know, the real, real world. Um, and, um, and then it has all these excerpts of like interviews and, and these various kinds of articles and things like that. And it's like, it's very, it's very varied in terms of how many different kinds of things that are, are, are there. Um, and, as you read the story, there's this like meta world building that occurs in your brain as you fill in all of the gaps because the author is just giving us these like almost like bullet points throughout the story because because of the way the story is written. Um, and it's, re it's a really interesting experience to read. And I think as an exercise in developing your world building and, you know, uh, giving this illusion, um, I think it's a very good example to look at to see how did that author do it and try to figure out how you can apply that to, uh, you know, sort of maybe a novel or a, or a whole RPG setting or whatever it is. Wonderful. I love that. I love that approach. Um, 
Jason, do you have anything to add? Illusion of a deep and immersive world. Again, when you're dealing with short fiction, it, it's all about those tiny details, isn't it? Oh, yeah. Um, so I, I don't know how my fellow panelists feel about this bit of advice, but sometimes when a writer is struggling to um, flesh out the world, I kind of encourage them to lean into genre tropes. Uh, just because sometimes there's shorthand uh, there for world building, um, it's not something you want to do too heavily, but it's a good way to uh, spark the imagination and to give yourself a beginning point so that uh, you can, you know, say, okay, I'm writing a story on a mining colony on, on a meteorite or on an asteroid. Uh, so you take what you know from that and uh, build on it. Uh, Amazing. Amazing. I love that approach. Uh, funnily enough, we had a whole seminar, a whole panel yesterday about tropes and using them and inverting them. So mm. if oh. you're sitting there thinking, I love this idea and I don't know where to go next with it, then uh, guys, all of that will be available on VOD uh, and uh, you'll be able to check that all out. Uh, CL, I'd love to hear your thought on this, because again, as mm -hmm. a as somebody who's who's done many different things and, and as a writer of novels, I think I think we're, you're going to have a really interesting <laughs> approach to this. Um, so one of my approaches, I think my biggest approach is actually probably through the characters, um, and their understandings of the world. And part of it is like, I really, I love, um, I love the idea of patterns. I've never thought of it that way, but that's such a, it's such a good, mm -hmm. like, oh, I love it. I'm definitely stealing that. <laughs> um, but also just like having characters with very particular reactions, they will react to their world because they live in the world. Um, like the same way I know that, um, you know, if I don't want to have my feet splashed with mud, that I don't walk down a certain street on trash day because I know that's like all the, like everyone puts their trashes out and it smells gross. So that is a pattern that I like, mm -hmm. I have find myself walking into. And so characters will also have their like, okay, we don't go down this street because this is where you get robbed. So we go down this street instead. And so you build up the idea of a city or a, a culture or, um, even just like your own character's little world-based idiosyncrasies. Um, but also like characters together will make their own world. So like having characters with a shared history or a shared set of inside jokes, um, like a certain kind of character will always know. Um, actually, this kind of goes back to an essay that I wrote um, for on world building for the um, the cobalt thing with John is like there's we have a shared understanding of stories and and texts very often um, and songs and having these little cultural tidbits shared between characters is um, a really great fast shorthand like if they all can sing this one sea shanty or if they all know this little nursery rhyme then it makes the world feel that much deeper. Like this is a song, there is a song that every child who's from this city knows. Like mm -hmm. even if only two characters sing it to each other, you have an entire world. And if there are five characters together and two sing the song and three stare at them like weird and one of them sings a different version of the song, that has set up like several countries mm -hmm. potentially um, just with that one little exchange. Um, and then the other thing that I really like is just the idea of leaving gaps for the the readers, either as mysteries or as something that the reader can figure out. Um, but there's a lot of energy sometimes and leaving something that the reader has to um, make the jump for. Like, maybe we don't say necessarily in my little example of the nursery rhyme, maybe we don't say where that nursery rhyme came from, but just like nursery rhymes from our world often have some sort of background. Like I always think of the ring around the Rosie as a black plague song. Um, depending on the text, there might be something else that the reader can then dive a little deeper into on their own um, and their own imagination. And so that's one of the really fun things for me to do is leave something for the reader to fill in. Mm. Yeah, I adore that. I think um, 
what I've been hearing from everybody is, you know, when we do world building, we often think world building is big things. World building is I made a country, I made a religion, I made a giant tree. Um, but actually what world building is when you get to the performance part of world building, which is when somebody's sitting down reading your novel, when somebody's playing your game, actually it all comes down to show, don't tell. It all comes down mm. to the way that they interact with the world, whether it's the MC or the character, which is, you know, the, the proxy for the player. It's that end user interacting with the world. That's the space that the world building is supposed to really come alive. And so we we have to create those moments, essentially. Those those sort of moments that we have to use every everything in our craft toolbox, like CL Clark was saying with the with the songs, like uh, Chris was saying with the patterns. You know, we have to use every single thing we have in our toolbox to make those moments feel immersive um cl i loved your example of um the the the, the trash on garbage day right <laughs> uh do you have other examples of of you know just just like off the top of your head little tidbits that you can use like that to, to show a larger truth in a in a micro mm. uh, a micro moment essentially oh man now i'm on the spot I don't know. um what else would i do um <laughs> if anyone else wants to jump in, feel free, guys. I'll jump in. Um, yeah. I assume a lot of our fan base probably have have uh, read the Wheel of Time or NBC the TV mm. show. This only applies to the books. One of my favorite parts of the books, Rand arrives uh, in the city of Camelin, and everywhere he looks, people have their swords tied with peace knots. Mm. And some mm. of these peace knots are red with white trim, and some of them are white with red trim. And the people are eyeing each other like we want to kill each other. It's obviously some massive schism in the middle of their society. It's great world building, but we have no idea what it means. Why is mm -hmm. this? And, and so the gradual unfolding over the course of a couple of chapters where he just randomly buys one and because it's cheaper, um, he buys, I think, the, the white with the red trim. Mm. And, and that ends up declaring his loyalty to the queen. Um, I thought that was such a brilliant bit of world building. So you can really do something by opening a loop in the reader's mind, by showing them a custom, but not explaining it. Like to us, mm -hmm. if you have a wedding ring on, we all know what that mm -hmm. means. If you see that ring on somebody's finger, we don't think about it. We just know. Mm -hmm. Our mm -hmm. goal as authors is to present a custom like that, but don't explain it. Mm -hmm. Let the um, the context and the behavior of the characters explain it for them. And the moment they make their connection in the head, they worked for it. They'll love it, or they understand why the wedding ring is the wedding ring, or why you know you're you're wearing the white and the red. If we're talking about the wheel of time, yeah, that's such a good example. Fantastic. Been... Yeah, I love that example. That's that's genius. Any others? Anybody wants to throw in there? I was going to throw in um, a non-token kind of thing. Uh, if you want to write about a dystopian world or a post-apocalyptic world, you know, uh, tell us how big a dispute there is over food, uh, how mm -hmm. far people will go. Uh, so if um, someone's willing to kill over, a, you know, a deer carcass, then we know, okay, things are very, very dire in this world. Um, it's just little things like that. Yeah. Wonderful. Mm -hmm. So that, that actually brings me quite nicely onto my next question, which is, um, do you have any tips for guiding readers along a learning curve of a more complex setting? So every now and then you need something a little bit more complex than your world building to make it work. A complicated magic system, a hierarchized society. It's critical to the pro plot. It has to be there. It can't be cut. Mm -hmm. What are your tips for guiding readers along that learning curve in a way that doesn't feel like an expo dump and feels mm -hmm. like a journey that people are excited to go along? This can be readers or, or players, by the way. Mm -hmm. Chris, I see you. <laughs> so uh, ask the question one more time. Uh, any tips for guiding readers along a learning curve of a complex setting? So what you want to do is, is this is a story choice early on. And when I was talking about plot gardening and you're doing the story at the same time you're doing the world building, this is where it matters. You have to pick somebody who's not familiar with stuff in the world. The, the POV, the protagonist, needs to be somebody who doesn't understand the customs that the reader doesn't understand. It doesn't understand many things about the world that the reader doesn't, so that they have a guide, somebody who's going to go into the world and learn about it. And the best example I would use is Harry Potter. Mm -hmm. Harry Potter doesn't know much about the wizarding world, um, and neither do we. 
So for him to learn about it, it's all wonder, it's all new things, and, and it's all exciting for us, the reader, and for him, the character, to see it. So as an author or a storyteller in a gaming campaign, you really want to unfold it in the same way where you're picking the scenario accordingly. So like, I don't know, maybe all of your characters are going to be fighting in a gladiatorial arena, and that needs to be the introduction of the story you want to tell. But you have to make choices about the story that will inform the reader, if that makes sense. I love that. CL, what are your thoughts on this? I'd love mm -hmm. to hear, uh, as somebody, again, who's written novel-length things and <laughs> short stories, like, it, it's two very different forms, but it's it's often the same problem, right? I, I, I will preface this by saying first, um, I might not be the most generous of writers uh, on this score, um, not because I don't love my readers, because I do, but because I just grew up, you know, reading these really, really complicated books that for me, that very slow process of figuring things out has always been part of the joy, not something that I would like cut through. Like I, I'm, I'm very into the long, like, mm. you will not understand this book for approximately <laughs> 100 pages, but then the next 500 pages will be excellent. <laughs> um, so that's that's my my disclaimer <laughs> um but definitely i um i agree that having a, a sort of neophyte character can be cool but i also kind of like i like following somebody who already knows everything and and part of this i think is a little bit my my propensity to leave gaps for the reader and so it's taking a character who does know everything or knows enough about everything and seeing what they take for granted um so like if there's a character who knows that um this thing is forbidden and we see we will we will see them either they're so powerful that they can do whatever they want even though they have to go to a shady place to do it so like um, I had the idea of this this um, character who um, is high power but wanted to buy some sort of illicit drug um, and they can think very quickly like, um, you know, this would be so much harder if I, you know, wasn't um, like if I had to go down to the slums or whatever. It could be, you know, maybe not quite so, so um, clumsy as that in this situation, but just having someone take certain things for granted or know that I have to do this to do this. Mm -hmm. And so we, we watch them do it. Um, and that kind of helps structure the world for us. Um, even just just getting to watch them travel through a place. Um, like, also, this is technically cheating. Mm -hmm. um, and it doesn't always work, especially for short fiction, but having multiple points of view and so even if all the characters know everything, like they're all like um, normal knowledge level, they might all see things differently. In fact, they probably should have different perspectives of the world. Um, and so their opinions will also tell us a lot about um, how the world is set up, how um, society is, strat is stratified. Um, and then I, then I just kind of, as a writer, I personally just kind of expect the reader to fall in and, mm -hmm. and catch the bits in time for the big major story things. Um, and with short fiction, I think I do try to make it a little bit more streamlined, a little bit less complicated, just because of, again, the size that we're working with. Um, but yeah i think even so I, I i might i guess i might be a little bit more open and say this is how the world is if i need to in a short story than i would in a novel um, yeah i love that love the idea that we there's sort of two ways that you can do it so far obviously there's many ways you can do it but there, there's two very strong things there the one is have an audience surrogate who doesn't know anything they are john snow you need to explain everything to them and then the other one is you follow a character who is wise and the audience is the audience surrogate in a way because mm -hmm. they, you know they are watching on the details and you're careful to meet out those things mm -hmm. jason how do you find that you end up helping authors when they with this as an editor like do you, is this something that you you end up having to help authors with often, or is this something that's that's usually not an issue by the time a manuscript hits you? Hmm. Hopefully um, not literally. Well, it depends on the form, um, novel versus short story. Uh, when it comes to novels, I uh, 
one of the most common questions new writers have for me is how do I know where to begin my book? And I tell them, you know, try to think of your novel at least the first, I don't know, act of it as a telescopic, you know, um, Mm -hmm. first you're, you know, looking at a very fine point, uh, hopefully your protagonist and, as the chapters unfold, you bring out that lens a little wider and wider and wider. And um, from there, uh, that's where you uh, dump the details in, just around that. Um, now, with short fiction, I tend to tell them it's kind of a similar concept, but I think of it more in like a thematic concerns uh, and plot. Uh, so, you know, with your opening, you want to establish the conflict, and from there, you hint, suggest, uh, you know, your thematic issues, and as the paragraphs go past, uh, you kind of expand on that about a character's actions, uh, the setting, you know, the tone of your piece. So, amazing. And uh, John Joseph Adams, I I must hear your uh, your feeling on this again as somebody who's who's managed so many different media mm-hmm. and has worked as an editor for so many different styles of of storytelling. How how do you suggest that we guide our end user, whoever that is, mm-hmm. along this curve of complexity? Hmm. Uh, as I was listening to everybody, the, the sort of jokey answer that occurred to me was, well, read the book of the new sun by Gene Wolfe, study it very closely, and then world build completely the opposite the way he did. Um, <laughs> oh, you know, spicy. Yeah. Okay. No, and, and I don't, I don't, I don't mean that to be negative on book of the new sun. It's amazing. It's just that it's incredibly challenging to read and to, you know, like he, there's, this is like walking around on the death star. There's no safety rails anywhere to keep you from falling off the edge. Okay. You know, um, you know, so it's like it's um, yeah, like it's very easy to like start reading that book and or really four books. But like and then just completely lost. And like, I don't know what's going on here. And, and it's like it, it's a lot of work. OK, but uh, it is richly rewarding. As CL was saying, it's like when you have one of those books where it's like, OK, well, that's part of the enjoyment is, is actually figuring out all, all of the things in it. But if your goal is to guide the readers, like don't do it like that. Um, but um but yeah, I mean, I think uh, I agree with uh, you know all the stuff everybody else was saying. But um, I mean, I think one of the one of the other ways you could do it, which isn't as uh, elegant as some of these other options, but like you know there could be text in the world in the in the book or the world that you know mm-hmm. characters can encounter if um, if there's some important like it's like a kind of a sneakier way to to have a little expo dump because it's like okay, well the character is actually going to read this thing, and it's like you know you have to keep it short and everything like that, but. Um, those kinds of things can um, can help guide uh, when otherwise it's too uh, sort of challenging to get the reader on the same pages to what the world is actually like. I love that. I think that's uh, very wise. So yeah, sorry, did you want to hop in there? Well, I was. I, I just thought it was really funny because I was actually recommended today um, mm. while critiquing a friend's story that actually does this really excellently with the intertext, but he was telling me about this precise Gene Wolfe uh, series and I, so uh, this is the second time in less than 24 <laughs> hours so I'm very curious um, but what I just wanted to add was something that I learned from uh, Mary Robinette Kowal it, was, it kind of um, goes back to what Jason was saying just the idea of hitting in a short story especially but when you open you are getting basically the entire story in a short microcosm of that first paragraph like you're learning who this character is what their problem is but whatever that problem is should also be directly related or in theory should also be directly related to um the uh to the problem or to the world building so the problem in the world building are locked in together and we learn all of that at the same time so that we not only understand um why we are telling this story in this particular place or time or whatever um but how come it matters that we have this spaceship or this character trying to solve this problem and all of that it we get that all from the beginning and then generally it's easier to 
Go ahead. Sorry, really using plot as a mechanism to deliver the world building in a way that is in motion and meaningful for the, the characters and therefore meaningful for the reader. Exactly, yeah. I love that. I absolutely love that. There is one final question that I have to ask. Mm -hmm. Are you ready for this? Mm -hmm. To prologue <laughs> or not to prologue? <laughs> yes. That is the question. Who wants yeah. to jump in on this? Give me a wave. Uh, I'll go. Um, yeah, so uh, I know like in publishing, there's all this talk about, about prologues and, and whether or not to use them. And, and it's gotten so ingrained that people should not use them. It's gotten so ingrained in a lot of writers' minds that they, uh, I saw when I was editing my novel in print, it's like I saw a lot of novels on submission that were like, okay, well, chapter one is a prologue here. You just called it chapter one instead of prologue. That's just cheating. Like, okay, either put a prologue in there and, you know, just call it a prologue or don't do one. You know what I mean? So, um, I mean, I think uh, personally, like I don't have a problem with the prologue as long as it's not like overly long. Like I love Game of Thrones, but like the Game of Thrones, Game of Thrones prologue is like 50 pages long or something. It's like really, really long. And it's like, okay. And then we never see most of those characters again, or, you know, it's like, it's, it's a way to show us the white walkers. I think it, it is if I recall correctly, but, um, you know, uh, in general, I don't think there's any issue with prologues. Um, obviously, in a short story, uh, it's 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 pretty rare and uh, 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 generally inadvisable. But in the right story, it could work. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, it's all about uh, is it necessary or not? Like, can you drop the reader in just with chapter one without any of that information and have it still work? Then then do it. But um, if you uh, you know absolutely need that stuff to, to to sort of lay some groundwork, then Try to do it as simply as possible, and then get out of the way. Um, um, I mean, I think uh, there are there are some like fantastic prologues that I've read over the years, uh, and uh, so I, I just based on that, I, I would be hard pressed to say never do it. Um, so I mean, I think it's just about being judicious about whether or not you need it and how long it needs to be. I love that. <laughs> I love that. Anyone else want to weigh in on prologues? I'll go for it. Go for it. Um, so prologues, in my genre at least, which is, is fantasy, um, which I, I think is very appropriate for today, and to a lesser extent science fiction, prologues exist as a way for you to give action to the reader um, if you couldn't ordinarily. So if you're writing a slow epic fantasy and you're starting with a farm boy and he's going to mm -hmm. be you know, shoveling hay for three chapters mm -hmm. and that's vital to your story mm -hmm. and you have to do this, with a prologue you can show sorcerers throwing fireballs at each other and summoning gods and whatever mm -hmm. else is cool about your setting. So if you look, go, going back to the Wheel of Time, if you look at the prologue to the Wheel of Time, mm -hmm. we have two of the most powerful um, uh, channelers in, in all of history battling each other. Mm -hmm. So we get to see just a little peek at what's possible in the magic system. Uh, and mm -hmm. I think that at least in my genre, fans have come to expect that. So all of my books have a prologue, uh, and they do so because it's an opportunity for me to show some cool historical event that is relevant to the story and give them a piece they wouldn't otherwise get. Um, I have written in other genres where I don't think prologues work very well, where people just like in thrillers, you just want to get into it. Mm -hmm. And if a prologue is just giving you an, another extra viewpoint, it's not going to serve the reader. They just want the action to start. Um, so I use the story circle as a, a plot um, method. Uh, there's a whole bunch of them out there. I recommend that you learn a few of the different story methods if you're, you're wanting to write. Um, but the story circle, it's a circle for a reason. You start at you, which is you give them a character, and it comes around to change where they're back in the same situation, but now they have changed and are greater and can, can solve the problem they originally couldn't solve. So if your prologue doesn't serve that structure, then it's not really worth putting in the book, in my opinion. Yeah, I love that approach. Well, folks, I've just seen the time. That is sadly all we have mm -hmm. time for today. You have all been absolutely wonderful. Chris Fox, John Joseph Adams, C.L. Clark, and Jason Sizemore. Thank you all so very much for appearing in the inaugural World Building Con. Thanks for having it us. Thanks so yeah, much. Yeah, so much fun. It was a blast. It's been an, I know, right? So fast. <laughs> Um, folks, the details of all of my fabulous guests here are going into the chat right now. We're going to go on a 10 minute break and then we will be right back with geography in world building. Yes, we are talking about maps. We are talking about geography that tells stories. We are talking about creating plot and wonder and mystery with our physical spaces. And who's going to be doing that? Award winning Andy Law and award-winning Kaora are both here to uh, talk game design, storytelling, and mapping all in one beautiful package. Well, folks, I'll see you very, very shortly. And in the meantime, you know what to do. Grab your hammer and go world build.